Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. I have just finished a discussion with Neil Shenvey about Christian nationalism. I invited a co-host to come on with me this time, and that's Krista Bontrager. So Krista and I uh, got to talk with Neil and ask him about what's the new developments in the Christian nationalist conversation. Now, if you recall, if you've been longtime listeners of the podcast, you'll remember that maybe a year ago, I did an episode about Christian nationalism with Neil. And I would, you don't have to watch that one for this one to be relevant. But if you want to go back into the archives and listen to that one first, that'll lead you right up into the conversation we're having right now. So that book, that was a review of the book, uh, Taking America Back for God by Whitehead and Perry, who tend to lean a little bit more on the left side of things. Uh, Sort of that book caused a lot of people to use the Christian nationalism label um, at their political opponents, I I guess you could say. But in the past couple of years, there have been more developments where there have been uh, self-professed evangelical Christians making a positive case for Christian nationalism and saying, hey, yes, we are Christian nationalists. And so Neil also reviewed the book, um, The Case for Christian Nationalism by Stephen Wolf. And so that's what we are interviewing him about today. But I really want you to listen to all the way to the end, because it was really like the last 30, 40 minutes where it just got so interesting as far as what this um, this case that's being made, what are the, the spiritual ramifications, the physical ramifications, ultimately uh, the case being that, uh, you know, Christians should implement the the Ten Commandments into civil law. That's essentially, as best I understand it, with the case that the book is making. And so Neil is going through uh, a lot of his concerns about that. Of course, um, I, I'm very concerned about that viewpoint as well. So if you want to just be up to speed on the Christian nationalist conversation, this is the episode for you. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Unshaken Faith podcast. That's my weekly little bite-sized podcast, 15-minute episodes with my good friend Natasha Crane, uh, the Unshaken Faith podcast. And without any further Further ado, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get into this conversation with Neil and my co-host Krista Bontrager. All right, Krista, you're my first co-host ever. Wow, How does I love it feel? Being first. I know you're the Feeling first fancy. one. I know. I feel like this is probably going to end up more like just a dialogue between the three of us, which I think will be great. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on to co-host this with me, I mean, you you could have had Neil on your podcast and I could have had him on mine, but I, I think this will be a really fruitful conversation because you and I have talked quite a bit about the topic of Christian nationalism and the developments in that conversation. You have thought about it way more deeply than I have, and you've thought about political philosophy a lot more deeply than I have. So, I thought it would be a great asset to have you on here to join me to ask some questions and join in the conversation. But um, t- tell us first, why are you interested in this conversation? Well, I think, um, you know, when when Monique Dusan and I, uh, my ministry partner at the Center for Biblical Unity, started dialoguing about these issues very early on when Monique was still kind of walking in the ways and the mindset of the critical social theories. One of her very first questions to me was basically, well, who decides, you know, what the laws are? What is the Mm. standard? And I didn't have a very good answer for that. Mm -hmm. And that really was the first time that it put the question on my radar, that this was something that I needed to think about and reflect on a lot more deeply. And That has led me down a very long and winding road, like you said, of political philosophy. And I don't in any way want to pass myself off as an expert or as, um, you know, having made up my mind completely there. This is still very much a work in progress for me. And Mm -hmm. I am still thinking through issues. And there's things I've spoken publicly about. Um from a political angle, I've done a lot of teaching on places where I see intersection between the Christian worldview and political issues, but there's a lot of things I haven't said publicly Mm -hmm. because I am still learning. Mm, That's good. Well, yeah, and this conversation is so interesting to me as well because of that same question Monique was asking you. It's, It's like every law legislates morality, right? It tells us what we can do and can't do with our bodies and 
you know, to other people. And that's all in the moral category of questions, which you either are grounding in an objective reality or it's going to be subjective. So these questions are very important for the Christian. But I want to go ahead and bring Neil in to this conversation. Neil, so glad that you're joining us to continue our conversation on Christian nationalism. Um, so just to kind of summarize, I want to direct our audience to our first episode um, that you can find in the archives. And we discussed the Whitehead and Perry book called Taking America Back for God, which really, to my knowledge, was the first uh, sort of book that addressed Christian nationalism. And of course, being it was being very critical of what they were calling Christian nationalism. Now, at the time, this was like when all of the chaos was happening. And it seemed to me at the time, like anybody who was a Christian who also loved America and cared about politics was being lumped in with this Christian nationalist category. And I still feel that pressure, right? right? If you're if you're a public Christian and you have anything to say about maybe abortion or that you love America or that you feel a deep sense of patriotism and commitment to your country, or if you think America is the greatest country, you're automatically labeled Christian nationalist. And I think that's still going on. But I want us to untangle this. I want us to discuss this from a biblical worldview. And then now fast forward to 2022, another book comes out. Now, this is when, okay, so up until this book came out, up until 2022, I was maintaining that, you know, this is not a real thing. This is something that people are just, it's like a boogeyman. And maybe I wasn't being fair about that. Maybe there was more to be concerned about. But then co along comes this book, and I start seeing it on uh, social media where Christians are saying, yes, I am a Christian nationalist. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Now I, I'm seeing people actually identify themselves as Christian nationalists and saying, here's why it's a good thing. And then they're posting links to this book. And then when I looked at the book, it seemed like it was selling very quite well, but you said it, it actually hasn't sold. Maybe maybe it just had a little burst of, of some activity and it hasn't sold that well. But this book is called The Case for Christian Nationalism by Stephen Wolf. Wolf, and you've uh, reviewed this book. Um, so tell us a little bit about that book. Um, but first, let me see if Chris has got anything to add to that. Yeah, I think when I first, when the book first came out, I think what surprised me is how it gained traction so quickly. Mm. Um, I've watched several interviews with the author, Stephen Wolf, and uh, kind of understand his, his point of view. And um, I texted Elisa and I said, you know, hey, you need to get this book on your radar because this is really becoming an influential voice in the conversation really quickly. And in fact, I had a a private dinner with a very big, I would say, influencer, social media influencer, um, a couple of weeks after that book came out and we were sitting at dinner and if both of you know who this person is, mm. but um, if we were sitting at dinner and, and he was like, said he was working his way through the book and I started grilling him on all of my mm. questions about it and what it was. And, and he was like, wow, you know, so-and-so. And then he, he, he listed off like two or three people that he knew that this book had convinced them of mm. Christian nationalism mm. and other influencers that are in a similar stream as Monique and I. And then I started becoming kind of concerned at how quickly this this was what I thought, you know, influencing and reshaping the conversation. Like I'm I'm still thinking this through. <laughs> but battle lines were starting to be drawn really quickly, you know, are you for this vision or aren't you? And so I encourage Elisa to reach out to you and so we mm. can have this dialogue because I think that even if the book sales, you know, um, aren't like off the charts, I think this book is shaping the conversation for some people mm. in, in evangelicalism. So I think it's good for us to talk about it. So tell us about the book, Neil. What's the basic case it's making and what, what's yeah. it all about? Yeah, I'll just be clear. It's I don't say it's selling badly. It's definitely selling more than my book. So that's like <laughs> your scale of bestseller. It's not a not Tom Clancy, right? But it's it's right, definitely right. it's doing fine. Uh, I just think it's it's uh, probably a reaching a niche audience is the point I would say. It's yes. not reaching mm -hmm. broad. You know, it's not you know he's not going and doing interviews on Ben Shapiro, or Joe Rogan. Uh, it's still right, kind of a niche right. book. Um, so what's the main thesis? I think it's uh, 
pretty clear that he is just saying that um, he he thinks the ideal, the ideal for a Christian nation uh, is to be a Christian nation, which means he wants uh, the nation to be explicitly in favor of Christianity and to discourage other religions because he thinks the purpose of the government is to point its people, its citizens to both earthly and heavenly good. So it's that we would say, people would say, well, the government's job is to keep the peace on earth. But no, he said, no, the government's job is to do is to point people towards heaven and Christianity is true. Therefore, it means pointing people to Jesus explicitly. Um, so that's, and that's the main purpose of the book. And then, he, then he dives into well, what would that actually look like? He justifies that argument um, by appealing, um, we'll see in a second, not to scripture, but he basically starts with reformed Protestant theologies, the re- theology of the reformers um, and reformed political theology. And he says outright in the book, I'm not going to be appealing heavily to the Bible. I won't. I'm going to assume that the reformers basically got the tradition right. They, 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 their, their, their teaching on these issues was correct, and they'll work from there. Uh, and so I think in the first 120 pages of the book, I think there's one Bible verse that he directly cites. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's just the way the book works. He's starting mm-hmm. with the reformers and then building from there, not going back to say, well, how do you exegete these following texts? He just doesn't, he says, he says I'm not a theologian. I'm a political scientist. So I'm going to start with, with political theology. So um, this niche audience that we're talking about, I'd love to just focus on that a little bit, and then we can go into maybe some positives and negatives of the book. Um, it, it, this It seems to me like this is very much tied in with a very particular eschatology. Would I be right in saying that? That I'm seeing kind of at the same time, and Krista, you might be able to speak to this too, but it seems like at the same time, we're seeing sort of a resurgence. And I'm not saying this is uh, that... I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that a particular eschatology leads one to these Christian nationalist conclusions. I'm not saying that. But it does seem to work best within the framework of like a post-millennial, even theonomy type of eschatology. And those who have uh, begun to adopt this type of Christian nationalism have first adopted post-millennialism and then theonomy. Is that fair to say? Is that for Christo or for me? Uh, either one. <laughs> Krista might know better because you yeah, know, you're really in this. Yeah, I think that that's what I'm seeing. I mean, those are most of the interview platforms that um, the author has been on. Not not exclusively, but a lot of them, a good number of them have been reformed, post-millennial, and theonomy leaning or theonomy fully embracing. And by theonomy, you know, we're just looking at and, and I, I do follow many of these platforms on the regular and, you know, they're, they're using the Westminster confession ver, uh, definition of that, of, you know, embracing the general equity of God's law. In other words, that God's law um, not only points forward to the sacrifice of Jesus, but that it also provides a foundation for a moral code and that the those principles behind uh that moral code are universally applicable and ought to form the basic framework for civil government this and now there's different streams within theonomy of how that works out and how different things are applied but in the broadest way these seem to be the a large number of the people that the book appeals to And if anyone wants, like, I'm kind of new to the whole theonomy conversation. So if anybody else is like, what are all these words and what are they talking about? I'm going to recommend a video that really helped me kind of understand. This is a video between Joel Webin, who is a theonomist, and Mike Winger, who many of my audience know Mike. And Joel's a nice guy. I've been on his podcast. And basically, Joel is trying to convince Mike Winger to become a theonomist. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Mike didn't, he didn't go for it. But it's a great conversation to kind of learn the theology behind where that's coming from. And then I think for people who are trying to connect the dots, that'll help connect the dots to uh, what we're talking about here. So, okay, that, that I didn't mean to take such a left turn there, but let's get back to the book, uh, Neil. You know, obviously there are some instincts in the book that we can all relate with, right? There's there's questions being asked, maybe identifications of some legitimate problems. What what would you say is good about the book? What What's the positive takeaways, if there are any? 
so one surprising point is that um, Wolf's Christian nationalism really diverges in some ways from pop Christian nationalism. I'm talking about like, you know, guns and Jesus and mm-hmm. flags in the sanctuary and you sing the Star Singled Banner and in poor service, that kind of pop Christian nationalism, which again, Whitehead and Perry probably would point to is like, that's what we're talking about. Well, Wolf actually diverges sharply from that perspective in some ways. So for example, he says, quote, I'm ambivalent about national flags located inside or outside churches, but national flags should not be displayed in a sanctuary and especially not within sight during worship. Like, huh, that's not, again, when I think of like, again, Christian nationalism, I'm thinking of you know, red, white, and blue on the, uh, on the pews and like everywhere. But mm-hmm. he's like, no, 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 no. Th- because, and why? Because he believes that the pastor is in a quote, a Christian spirituality and worship are properly speaking about eternal life, not political struggle. Thus, pastors should not, in their official capacities at least, be social activists or political coordinators, especially from the pulpit. You're again like, wait a minute, that's not the vision I in my head I have of right. quote unquote Christian nationalism. And so he says he says elsewhere, he says the Christ, a Christian nation, any Christian nation, is not a holy nation in the sense that Israel was a holy when holy went under the Mosaic Covenant. No nation today is God's nation by some special divine command or by exclusive divine favor. So these are all things that just fly in the face of, again, pop, quote unquote, Christian nationalism. So that's that's actually refreshing that I actually think I, a, I would agree with all those statements. Um, so again, that's interesting. Another thing is that he does rely heavily on historic Protestant political theory. And like it or not, a lot of the early reformers uh, and for a long, for centuries would have been strong supporters of the kinds of th- the kinds of things that Wolf is outlining. He's retrieving their view of the government and and monarchy, things like that. I mean, he's not a monarchist per se, but he, you know, they supported the monarchy. They supported, you know, rulers and not not no dem- not democracy for certain. So uh, they they did not have a very positive view of religious freedom, and certainly not in our terms. So he's retrieving that. He's not pulling this out of the air. He's going back to the Reformation and saying, well, what did they think, and can we? Why not start there and apply it today? Um, He also challenges what's called classical liberalism, meaning this idea that everything's about individual rights and freedoms and autonomy and liberty and maybe consent. And he points out problems with that view, which is very popular today. I think I would consider myself a classical liberal, a, a pragmatic one, but I think I am. And so a lot of the criticisms I'm hearing, I think are valid. And frankly, I think a lot of, classical liberals out there, evangelicals are just, they're soft intellectually. They just take mm. for granted, oh, of course, r- religious freedom is awesome. And I'd say, well, why do you believe that? Well, of course it's awesome, but, but why? <laughs> it's just obvious. Well, I, we need to have something more than just relying on our intuition. I have that intuition. I'm a you know child of the, well, I had 1979 and 43. I grew up just obviously these things are good, but we have to ask, well, what does the Bible say? And I want to, so I think it's good for him to push that. So for example, here's a point, I think, I don't know if he made it or I've thought about it since reading his book, but we don't really have absolute religious freedom, even today in the US, for, and you can't, you can't have it. For example, right. some religions demand human sacrifice, right? Aztec religion, right? We don't have that. What about temple prostitution? That's illegal. Well, that's not fair. You, you're, you're prohibiting their free exercise of religion. Yeah, no, that's right. You can't not do that. Drug laws. Some religions prescribe taking hallucinogenic drugs. We say some, some we say, we say, okay. Sometimes we say no. The point is there is no possibility of absolute unfettered religious freedom. We're always going to prohibit, say, human sacrifice. Now you can say, well, that's because it violates the right to life. Okay. But you're pitting now absolute religious freedom against another right, which right wins. We've decided, well, right to life wins. Okay but you don't have absolute religious freedom. Uh, another point, harm. We like to say, well, laws should be about harm. And, 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 and what, what kind of harm? Well, with physical harm, like you can't punch people, you can't kill them. But wait a minute, there are other categories of harm that we recognize in the law, libel. If you, if you, li- mm-hmm. if you print lies that damage someone's reputation, that's, you, can, you can sue someone. Public nuisances, you can't go and play your radio in the street at 3 a.m. full blast, you can't do that. Obscenity. You can't walk around naked. You can't perform sex acts. You can't sell child porn. You're not, you're not physically harming people, but we know that's, of course you can't do that. But why? Because we're limiting freedom. We're limiting certain expressions that we've deemed to be non-harm, they're harms, but they're not physical harms. 
So Wolf asked, well, what about spiritual harm? Like if people really, really, really want to worship demons, why do we say, well, that's fine. But why? Isn't it, is it not harming them? It's harming them. As Christians, we know it is. So why should we say, well, it's got to be legal though, but why? Again, I'm not asking, I'm not saying yes or no, I'm just saying why. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Wolf realizes that there are pragmatic considerations and all these issues we're asking, we're trading off one kind of freedom for another kind. Or, you know, the, the freedom, freedom is good, but then there's a bad thing that comes out of it. So how do we balance that? So he's, his point is you have to exercise prudence. You have to realize there are trade-offs. And he says, yeah, you know, the, the reformers got some things wrong. They had religious wars. They slaughtered each other by the millions. That's bad. We should learn from that. But we should also learn from the fact that our current, you know, the government today and the culture today is going in the other direction, leading to incredibly terrible laws and bad public morality. Shouldn't there be a, some pushback and say, wait, how did we get here? So anyway, those are positives. I think challenging liberals. And then final, I'll, I'll stop in a second. Um, I, you know, I'm net critical of the book, so I like to provide some positives. Yeah, to balance sure. That. Uh, but finally, I think he gives a really good defense of cultural Christianity. Some people have celebrated the fact that cultural Christianity is on the decline. And he says, why would you do that? So here's two points that uh, I think come through. One is that um, if you love your neighbor, you want them to be in a Christian culture and to absorb Christian values and intuitions. So for example, if a non-Christian husband does not commit adultery because he grew up in a Christian culture that told him, well, adultery is bad and you're a bad person if you commit it, right? It doesn't make him a Christian. If he avoids adultery because he just feels ashamed for it, and he says, I want to fit in, I don't want to be ostracized, so I don't commit adultery. It doesn't make you a Christian or even a virtuous person. You're just doing it because you want to you feel better than other people. But your child grows up in a non-broken home. If a, a non-Christian woman doesn't abort her baby because she's been told her whole life, well, you can't do that. No good good Christian does that. She does not abort the child. She does not make her a Christian, but it means her baby lives. So he's pointing out, look, you might sneer, oh, these people aren't real Christians. They're hypocrites. Yeah, but they're still getting the blessing of obeying God's law, even if they do it not out of true love for God, but out of fear or out of guilt. But they're still living a, in some ways, a more flourishing life than if they'd given up, grown up in a broken home and aborted their child. So his point is, we should not be cheering for people to lose that basic moral grounding that comes from a Christian culture. That's a, that's a bad thing. It's a sad thing. We don't want more broken homes and, and aborted babies, right? Yeah. Um, and so, and then the final thing is that it's like, look, if you're really concerned about creating hypocrites, yes, yeah, Christian culture produces good church going people who on the inside are spiritually dead. He agrees with that, by the way. He said, cultural Christianity can, by itself, by itself, can produce nothing but hypocrites. He completely agrees. But his, his question still is, do you really believe that it's a net bad thing for evangelism? So do you think there are more Christians in Mississippi or in North Korea or in Iran? You, know, you get lots of hypocrites in Mississippi. I, I, I agree. But you also get many genuine believers because they are taught categories like law and gospel. A grace and forgiveness, uh, right and wrong, good and evil. And they're taught a basic Christian framework. And then when they hear the gospel, they can, they, it makes sense to them, as opposed to somebody who grew up in, say, North Korea, worshiping their, their leader and thinking he's God. Well, that's going to make it harder for you to understand the categories of the gospel. So anyway, all those are all positives. And uh, Krista, I don't know if you want to chime in. I want to take all my time here. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's something that's a feature that I have grown in my appreciation for um, when I think about somebody like my father and his generation, even though, you know, he grew up in an abusive home and, and without a dad and having so much difficulty in his life. Um, he also grew up in an era of the Boy Scouts and going to summer camp where they had some kind of um, civil religion as part of mm -hmm. the summer camp experience. And those things gave him a kind of a moral framework, even though, um, you know, he wasn't a Christian, mm -hmm. but it helped him think about his life of like the benefits of being honest and making an honest living and working hard and these sorts of things. And that there is some inherent virtue in that. And we mm -hmm. see that, I think there's a scriptural um, premise for that. I mean, when we look in, for example, the prophet Amos, 
God brings judgment against Gentile nations when they violate certain eternal moral principles Mm -hmm. that God will only um, tolerate injustice and particular kinds of injustice for so long. Mm -hmm. He he will allow that to go along for, for a while, but there does seem to be a precedent in scripture that God expects Gentile nations to obey certain basic principles of his eternal moral law. Mm-hmm. And that um, is persuasive to me. And I think that there's something to that idea of a civil religion. And I don't like the word religion, but maybe we could call it religious or Christian based civil ethics code or something mm-hmm. of that nature. And that we have enjoyed that in our country for, you know, 200 plus years. I think that there's some biblical grounding for that and a case for that that can be made. And I think we're seeing some of the fruits of transitioning away from that framework in mm-hmm. our cultural moment right now. And as things, as we're kind of engaging in, you know, whatever we want to call the the social shifts that are happening right now, um, we're seeing a different moral framework rise up and take its place. So let me ask you, Neil, about um, some of your thoughtful concerns and reflections about Wolf's book and his project, because I'd really like to get into that and and um, hear what you have to say. And I, I do want to commend to everyone to read Neil's very fine, long review on his website at shenviapologetics.com um, to just get even deeper into the, the details there. But let, let's talk a little bit about some of your concerns about the book. Sure. So I mentioned one. Let me just let me just read uh, Wolf's summary of what a Christian nation would look like, uh, just so you guys get a sense of what he, you know, he he himself says. This is the goal. This is what we're looking at. We talk about a Christian nation. He says, a Christian society that is for itself as a Christian nation will distrust atheists, decry blasphemy, correct any dishonoring of Christ, orient life around the Sabbath, frown on and suppress moral deviancy, and repudiate. Neo Anabaptist attempts to subvert a durable Christian social order. So you know he he's it's he's envisioning a society that's very different than uh, than the one we have today. Certainly, I think we could minimum say that. Um, so we'll get into that. But that's, that, that's how he describes the, the the sort of ideal society with a Christian leader. Um, so what are some concerns I have? So uh, again, I said very little Bible. That's not necessarily bad, but he's assuming. So I assume the Reformed tradition. So I make little effort to execute the biblical text. He's, so he says page 16, he's gonna start there. And if you don't buy that assumption, then well, you have to go back and figure out whether the reformed tradition is true or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not gonna, again, I'm just saying, I'm pointing out that it makes it hard for evangelicals to evaluate his arguments. Because if you are reformed and you buy that tradition and you think that he's um, using it properly, I'm not a theologian or a political theologian, so I can't even tell you whether he's using the sources properly. But if he is, assuming he is, um, for average evangelicals, you have, you can't say, well, this verse contradicts what you said, or this, you're not executing this properly. Cause he's not doing that. He's just saying, well, so-and-so says this, right? So, mm. okay. Is he right or wrong? He's not the Bible. So it's hard for a Christian who's good at the Bible, but maybe bad at say, um, some of these reformers to, to evaluate what he's saying. Uh, okay. Another, here's a big problem. He doesn't define the word nation clearly or precisely, and he says he doesn't. He says the idea of nation is notoriously difficult to define, and identifying true nations is equally challenging. My interest, however, is not to discuss and identify nations and nationhood. So, so wait a minute. If you're going to call your book Christian Nationalism, and you're not sure what a nation is, he's kind of like, well, we just kind of know it when you see it. Well, but that's, impo- that's going to become very important if you're going to build a Christian nation. They're like saying, I'm all about Christian nationalism. What's well, a Christian shmation? Well, I don't know really, but I'm just saying I'm all about Christian shmationalism. You have to define what that word means, and it's going to be very important in a second. So but he never says clearly, well, what is a nation? He doesn't really say. He kind of, he the closest he comes is a nation is a group of people who see themselves as a people. That makes sense? That if you conceive mm. of yourself as a people who are my people, 
we share a language, a culture, and ancestry as we as part of it, then you're a nation. So sharing all those things in some sense makes you a nation. Okay. But he doesn't define it clearly, and that becomes a problem. Here's a big one, though. Um, he, when he imagines the ideal system, not a realistic one, but ideal one, he talks about the Christian prince. That's his ideal civil magistrate, the ruler of the Christian nation he calls a Christian prince. And here's some, here's some quotes from his book. High, having the highest office on earth, the good prince, the Christian prince, resembles God to the people. Indeed, he is the closest image of God on earth. Hmm. The prince, and again, the prince is a sort of national God, not in the sense of being divine himself or in materially transcending common humanity or as an object of prayer or spiritual worship or as a means of salvific grace, but as a mediator of divine rule for this nation and as one with divinely granted power to direct them in their national completeness. That's 287, 28. Mm -hmm. There's another one. This is, okay, you brace yourself. <laughs> the Christian prince can adorn himself and his residence, his house, with Christian symbols. As crosses were once painted on royal armor, his military or militia, which defends a Christian people and their church, can mm -hmm. be designated soldiers of Christ. It's 296, uh, 297. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, I identified the prince as the mediator of civil rule, and I described him in godlike terms following scripture. The prince is an image of Christ to his people, page 309. Uh, and okay, here's, uh, uh, I don't know how much we have here. There's more to it. Uh, two more. Uh, no, here's just one more. The Christian prince has the power to call synod, synod so meetings of the church leaders, in order to resolve doctrinal conflicts and to moderate the proceedings and can confirm or deny their theological judgments. And wow. in confirming them, they become the settled doctrine of the land. So he's envisioning a Christian, a set, you know, a ruler, it's a political ruler, not a, he's, not, he's very clear, yeah. not a pastor, not a church official, not, he's a political ruler, but he has sort of, authority to say this doctrine is our nation's doctrine and that he consults he says he consults with theologians and pastors like a like a wise father would consult his medically trained son on matters of medicine right you consult your son he's a doctor but in the end you're the dad mm. and so you say this doctrine is now the official national church doctrine for the land Okay. I have so many questions. Can I pop in okay. with a couple of questions <laughs> sure. and then I'll let you continue. But yeah. I mean, I have so many questions right now. Okay. <laughs> so um, this in this view, in his view, would this effectively end denominations? Would And could it lead to persecution? Let's say that he decides and, you know, wisely or whatever decides that the official doctrine of America is, you know, reformed cessationism, let's say. Yeah. Um, are charismatics and uh, Arminians going to be persecuted in his view, or will there be legislation made against those views? I mean, is that what this could lead to? Okay, so he would say that um, that the Christian prince has the authority to enforce right doctrine. And now he does point out that even in the Puritan era in New England, which was very little religious freedom, we say it, but, but he points out that yeah, they, they have the reputation of being these dour, strict, terrible, but actually he said they were actually very willing to accept um, non-conforming uh, or non, you know, the people that were outside their denomination into their churches. They, they knew like, there's not like a first Baptist and uh, first Presbyterian and the first every street quarter in New England. So they welcomed in their Baptist brothers and said, hey, you can worship with us. You can't, you can't make our church a Baptist church. You can't overturn our, you can't teach Baptist theology, but you're a brother in Christ. You can, you can fellowship with us. So they were very open to that kind of pan, he called it pan Protestant uh, ecumenism, right? They wanted mm -hmm. to have all Protestants who worship the same Jesus, who believe the same basic doctrines to worship together. They were okay with that as long as they didn't disrupt the, you know, the commonwealth, they didn't disrupt town life, et cetera. Um, so I think he would say that he'd say in theory, uh, if you're talking about people who are actually teaching a heresy, that the Christian prince has the authority to to even execute them. Uh, he actually says in, a, in one spot, he says, here we go, uh, page 359. The question is whether a Christian magistrate having civil rule over a civil society of Christians may punish with civil power false teachers, heretics, blasphemers, and idolaters 
for their external expression of such things in order to prevent, one, any injury to the souls of the people of God, two, the subversion of Christian government, Christian culture, or spiritual discipline, or three, civil disruption or unrest. So basically, if you're a heretic or a blasphemer or an idolater, can you be punished for just, you know, for hurting the souls of Christians, for leading them astray, for subverting Christian government or culture, or for causing civil disruption or unrest? He says, modern religious liberty advocates deny this, and I affirm it. So the Christian mandate can punish all those categories of people, including false teachers and heretics, with civil punishments. Here's one more. <laughs> all right. All right, Lisa, hold on. Buck, okay, buckle up. I'm trying. Have something. Okay. Arch heretics, arch heretics. So people that are heretics will do not let go of their doctrine. They've been they've been admonished. They will not listen. So arch heretics who are publicly persistent in their damnable error and actively seek to convince others of this error to subvert the established church, to denounce its ministers, or to instigate rebellion against magistrates can be justly put to death. Page 391. Um, this is not, no, he adds, but this is not to say that capital punishment is the necessary soul or desired punishment. Banishment and long-term imprisonment may suffice as well. So, I mean, I think it's it's very clear from this. At a minimum, he's saying that the Christian prince in an ideal situation has the authority to execute capital punishment against people who just will not denounce, will not give up their heresy and get, go teach it in public. The end result is death penalty. Maybe banishment, maybe imprisonment. Um, and then that extends, though, to like, what about if you're a Baptist? Like, he's a Presbyterian, and he says actually at one point that you know, Baptist theology does not really go well with Christian nationalism because he says, I should find the quote, but he says, um, when the, I'll find it later. But okay, the, the bottom line is that, like, wait a minute, are you going to put Baptists in jail? Because that happened once upon a time in England. So are we going to start jailing Baptists? I'm a Baptist. I don't really want to go to jail, even, you know, especially at the hands of a fellow brother in Christ. Mm -hmm. But he would say, uh, no, you know, in, in, in an ideal world, maybe, maybe where everyone was a Presbyterian and you're just this obstinate Baptist who refuses to just come to church and you just want to shout in the government and call us all terrible. Well, eventually we're going to say, you, know, go to, you have to go to jail. You're breaking the law. But he'd, he'd be in favor in a pluralistic society, in a society filled with non-Christians and, and, you know, and all kinds of people with, with atheists. We'd have to use prudence, is the word he uses a lot, prudence. You can't just go from modern America, 2023, in six months, you're going to be, you know, what's, what's the Handmaid's Tale, the state of Gideon or something? Like, you can't, Gilead. Gilead, you can't, yeah. You can't flip switch and do that. You have to exercise prudence in how much religious uh, control can you exercise. And clearly in our nation like ours, you can't do that. So he's envisioning like a pan-Protestant nation that basically looks something like America in say the 19, pre-war America, 1920s, 30s, where culturally you had cultural Christianity. You had presidents quoting the Bible. It was expected everyone would go to church. That is, he's, he's, he's saying he's not, it's not ideal for him, but it's the, sort of the best we can do with what we have. So, but, but, but in theory, he's okay with all the things he said in principle. That's the, that's the, that's, oh, that's not unjust. Well, I want to take a moment and tell you about today's sponsor, Good Ranchers. Guys, for a long time, I have really cared about the quality of meat that I buy for my family that I cook dinners with. And I didn't know until recently that over 70% of the meat that you buy in the grocery store, even the super fancy, foofy grocery stores, is imported from overseas. And that's why I love Good Ranchers. Not only do I love Good Ranchers because the meat just tastes amazing. I love that the chicken is triple trimmed. I also love that the standards on the chicken is what is called better than organic. If you've been following the organic standards, they've been lowering them as time goes by over the past few years. And so Good Ranchers gives you chicken that's better than organic. So uh, you get 100% American grown, hand trimmed, steakhouse quality meat delivered right to your door. We love it. We eat uh, Good Ranchers meat almost every night that I cook in the home. So if you want to go to goodranchers.com slash Alisa, make sure you use the code Alisa to get $30 off any box you get in February. So again, that's goodranchers.com slash Alisa. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. I 
I guess I'm wondering, this is something I have not heard him address in interviews, is where would that leave our Roman Catholic and Orthodox mm -hmm. friends? Because they're not Protestants. Yeah. And I, I, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, because obviously it leaves out Muslims, Jews, Hindus, atheists, but what would he do with, with Catholics and Orthodox people? So I think, again, I think that actually, and he hasn't addressed this specifically. Um, I think that given what he says and hints at in the book, he's not saying that the U.S., in even the best case scenario, that given the pluralism of our country today, you know, we're not going to we're not going to kick out even even maybe Hindus and, and Jews. You know, we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to tolerate them, but we're not going to promote them. We're not going to say how awesome it is. We're going to because as a Christian nation, this is him speaking, by the way, not me. <laughs> but I think you would say we'll tolerate other religions, tolerate them, but we're going to discourage them. Right. We're not going to throw them in jail, but we're not going to like, it's like, oh, you, oh, you know, you have your displays and you have your, the Satanic, Satanic temple wants to put up a display. You do it too. No, you're not. It's illegal. So he would be totally willing to draw the line at certain and say, no, we're not going to have Satan worship in this country. I'm sorry. You'll go to jail. Um, so, but I think he, he, he probably would be open to saying, yeah, we're going to tolerate Catholics and Orthodox and then even maybe Jews and Muslims. Um, but, but we're not going to, we're going to be a Christian pan Protestant nation officially with the ideal of eventually over time, over generations, shifting people more and more into this kind of pan Protestant ideal. And it, the analogy that's often used by these advocates is the reason they're talking about Presbyterianism so much is because of the the idea in Presbyterianism of covenant families, yeah. covenant language, and covenant children. Mm -hmm. So because I baptized my child um, into the covenant, but when they get older, you know, they might walk away from their faith. But as long as the father's in the home, the father is the one who is enforcing that the child go to church and be obedient and mm -hmm. honor their parents. And so um, the government is sort of compared to the father. And this is why Presbyterianism is, is the framework. And, and there was a big dust up after the book came out where it, there was some jokes that were made of like, well, Baptists, you know, really can't be the ideal Christian nationalist because... Oh, there's a quote. Let me read the quote here. There it is. Okay. I got it right in front of me. He says, quote, infant Baptist is the position uh, most natural... So infant baptism is the position most natural for baptizing infants, brings them outwardly at least into the people of God. So infant baptism fits with Christian nationalism. Why? Listen, when the body politic, so the body of people in the, in the society, when the body politic is baptized into the Christian nation, all are people of God. Credo baptism, that believers' baptism, that Baptist practice, credo baptism likely creates problems for Christian nationalism. It is no accident that Baptists tend to be advocates of near absolute religious liberty. That's not only due to their tradition or of descent. So he's saying his vision is when you make the nation a Christian nation, then in some real sense, everybody becomes the people of God. Not just in some like, not, but you know, he's not saying they're all Christians. In internally, but externally, they're expected to conform to God's will and to obey God's law, just like the baptized baby is. And he says, actually, that whole framework is Presbyterian. It's not Baptist. Baptists don't think that you baptize a non-believing infant because, and then expect it to act like a Christian. Uh, we have a whole other theology of how, what baptism is. Anyway, so he makes the point himself that, that, you know, that doesn't really fit well with Baptist theology because it, yeah. Anyway, so he, he says it himself. So this is why this this framework has so much appeal, I think, to Reformed and Presbyterian people, why it's gaining traction, you know, in certain um, theonomic circles. But there are Reformed and theonomic Baptists. And so that was mm -hmm. a bit of a conversation early on after the book was released. I think a, a, another important thing to point out about this book, Neil, and I'd love to have, have us explore a little bit, is his embedded with his definition of a nation of kind of people that associate together and having these voluntary associations together 
how he talks about the issues of race and ethnicity. I think yeah. this has been an issue of great confusion. Um, there were a lot of Twitter threads early on after the book was released, uh, characterizing Wolf as a racist. So I want us to spend a little time understanding his highly, um, I'm going to call it uh, nuanced and a little bit unusual position about that issue. That's exactly right. I think the, the biggest, most problematic part of the book is his how he deals with ethnicity and nation. So he says, he already talked about how he doesn't really define nation clearly. He just doesn't. It's not his interest. Um, but he also, he doesn't define nation very clearly and precisely. He also uses the terms nation and ethnicity synonymously. He says, I use the terms ethnicity and nation almost synonymously. Um, with slight differences in when he uses which, but they're basically synonymous. Um, he, so now, okay, so normally that was that what you, okay, so what you're saying is you're for Christian nationalism, but if ethnicity and nationalism are the same to you, then you're kind of talking about Christian ethno nationalism. <laughs> because he's like, mm. no, 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 no. Well, well, wait a minute. Well, then, then pick, I'm like, it's a really poor choice of words. It's super duper duper unwise to use the term ethnicity because. He, okay, so, uh, for example, um, he says that, uh, okay, so he, here's what he says. So he, he's saying, okay, nation means some kind of a people group that are united in culture, language, and feeling of their, they are a people group, they're their own people, they're my people, okay? And he uses the word nation or ethnicity interchangeably. We're like, but well, wait a minute, ethnicity normally means like Hispanic, French, you know, what, European, that's what ethnicity, Asian, Chinese, American, something like that. But he doesn't mean that, I think, but it's a, it's a terrible choice of words. Okay. But let's assume that he just means, you know, ethnicity just means an, an, a people group, like a nation. Okay. But here's what he says about it. It's, that's, this is still wrong, even if you grant his weird definition. He says this, people of different ethnic groups can exercise respect for difference, conduct some routine business with each other, join in inter-ethnic alliances for mutual good and exercise common humanity, like the Good Samaritan. But they cannot have a life together that goes beyond a mutual alliance. They cannot have a life together that goes beyond mutual alliance. Now, that's bad. That's, that's not true. Now, he says elsewhere, not in the book, in the Twitter, he's like, well, I just meant a political life. And I'm thinking, but, but look, for a Christian... We don't primarily think in terms of political life. Life together means a much of a life together, like for example, in the church. Yeah. And so, example I give is when I was in New Haven, my men's Bible study included a Romanian math grad student, uh, a medical student from Ghana, a white hedge fund manager, a part Native American, black part black carpenter, and me who's half Indian. So we were by de by no definition of ethnicity were we the same ethnicity. We were literally from other countries. <laughs> But we loved each other. We did life together. And it, what do you think? We're not voting together, but these are some of these people are U.S. citizens, even. So, what is he? That whole vision that we can't really, really, because they're not my people. They are my people because they're Christ's people. And so that very way of thinking, even maybe he's just thinking too much in terms of politics. But I'm saying we have to think not in terms of politics primarily, but in terms of the church and Christian unity. Now I get, he makes the point, well, look, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you can really relate to some person who doesn't speak your language. Like if you, they literally can't communicate with you. There's some wonderful Christian person, but they're living in Bhutan and don't speak your language at all. You have a great unity in Christ, yes, but you can't, you can't work, you can't, you can't talk. <laughs> so I get that, but still I, thinking in those terms, and, and he's talking again about it seems like an occasion he's talking about, again, the standard definition of ethnicity is like my people, people that you relate to. That's a very corrosive idea for Christians to say, I can't mm. really relate to you because, yeah, sure, we're both Christians and maybe we both speak English, but you're not my people. I'm like, that's not how the Bible talks about who is right. whose people. Um, I, I mean, I read my review, but there, you know, New Testament has over 100 references to other Christians using familial language like brothers, the household of God. Um, Peter in first Peter says, uh, to the, to the Christians, you are a chosen race. The Greek is genos, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, ethnos, where we get the term ethnicity. He calls Christians a holy nation. So for the Bible, they're thinking in, they, they are thinking in terms of the Christian as a peoples, 
a genos, a, a ethnos, a people for, for God's own possession. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. So it's almost reverse of how Wolf's thinking. Now, he has reasons for why he thinks that, you know, in a, on a natural level, cultures and natural familial units are, are have to take priority for politics over our unity in Christ. He wouldn't deny unity in Christ. But I'm saying if you look at the way the Bible talks about these categories, it reverses that. It, it's more concerned about unity in Christ than about politics and, and alliances and forming governments. So, anyway, so I, you know, okay, so I, I'm willing to say maybe he's just not wording this very carefully or maybe we're misunderstanding him, but I would really hesitate, and for other reasons, I have very big concerns about how he's thinking about ethnicity and nationalism. Um, and and while that, there's much more I could go, I think I'm about to say this because let me just be frank, uh, ra racism within Christian nationalism as a broad movement is a very real concern. It really mm. is. And here, let me get, point out some things here. Now, uh, it'll be some about Wolf and about other people. But before his book was published, Wolf uh, had a, was a, there's a Twitter discussion about intergroup marriage, like any kind of intergroup marriage. And Wolf tweeted, while intermarriage is not itself wrong as an individual matter, groups have a collective duty to be separate and marry among themselves. And so people kind of probe, but what do you mean groups have to be separate? Is, and, and he responds to this, he says this, there's a difference between something being sinful absolutely and something being sinful relatively. Inter-ethnic marriage can be sinful relatively, but not absolutely. Now, to be fair, he deleted those tweets and he went on CrossPolitik on an interview and offered a bit of retraction and said he's just he was just thinking out loud about, well, do groups have a duty to preserve their culture? And if so, does it harm the group culture if you intermarry heavily with some other group because you lose the culture? So, okay, okay. So he took it back. He said, well, you know, I can see why it's confusing. So, okay. But now here's another point. Okay, so I, 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 I'm totally willing to say, okay, you know, you clarified, you didn't, you're not, you're not saying interethnic marriage is wrong. You're not saying that. But then a few weeks after the book was published, uh, it was discovered that he, the co-host of Wolf's podcast, which he'd done mm. for, I think, two and a half years, that that co-host uh, owned a Twitter account that posted really vile white supremacist content, not mm -hmm. like the modern version, like actual, like calling people racial slurs, some pornography, things like that. And actually, that same co-host had an essay posted on a white nationalist website. And in that essay, the co-host argued that we need to promote the use of get this critical race theory. Why? Because that will encourage a white racial consciousness and solidarity. He wanted that. He wanted to embrace CRT because that's going to push whites to create a white identity. Right? Now, wow. when that was discovered, so all these tweets were discovered. It was discovered it was the, the co-host. So Wolf repudiated the tweets. He's like, I did not know these were his. I repudiate them. Um, and he said, I had no idea that that was him. And he repudiates them now. He, you know, but I'm, uh, so I'm, again, taking him at his word. My only point is this. There is a problem within this Christian nationalist community with just outright racism. Yeah. I mean, I'm opposed very clearly to critical race theory. And one reason is because it's going to divide the church. And now you have people who are outright saying, as whites, we should embrace CRT because it will divide the church. And we like mm. that. We want whites to rise up and become racially conscious. I'm like, I'm sorry. I reject CRT when progressives use it. And I reject CRT when conservatives use it because I reject CRT as a Christian. So I think and there's, uh, okay, one more example. I'm sorry, I'm taking up so much time. But This is great. No, keep going. Okay. Uh, a few weeks later, um, I, I basically said, you know, I think there are bullets to bite. Like, you know, classical liberals have to can just buckle down and, and bite the bullet and say, we're going to allow drag queen story hour. We disagree with it, but it's the price of liberty. We're just going to go ahead and do it. And that's, you know, I think that's bad. I think we shouldn't do that. Uh, but that's a they're biting the bullet. They're being consistent. And I said, on the other hand, Christian nationalists have some bullets to bite. For example, do you, do you want to make Hindu temples illegal? And I thought that was going to be a, well, yeah, we don't want to do that. But I was surprised uh, that actually hundreds of Christian nationalists, self-identified Christian nationalists, poured onto my Twitter webpage and said, absolutely, uh, we should make Hindu temples should be illegal. They just, absolutely. There's no, obviously, it's, this is clear. And then some of them even told me, these are self-identified Christian nationalists, go back to India. 
Uh, and these are Christian nationalists uh, saying this. I'm like, oh, guys, I'm from Delaware, but whatever. Yeah. Okay. I'm not offended. I'm, but I'm, and, then, and then actually, well, those are just nutcases on Twitter. I mean, some of them have pretty big followings, but whatever. Twitter is full of, Twitter's a sewer. I get that. But here's the thing. Uh, so then uh, another uh, guy came on, in the midst of this discussion, um, a guy came on to my website and said this. He said, because uh, I, yeah, he said basically the wh white men's got conquered by immigrant immigrants don't belong here uh, and white men are being oppressed by immigrants and we had a, they need to leave leave our country so i made some joke about how i just said i said actually you know other people were here before the europeans were right here's what he said this is another rando on twitter i get it he said europeans didn't immigrate we conquered we put the native demon worshipers to the sword and took the land for christ the lord took most of the rest by plague but since the invasion began in the 1960s, that's the immigrant invasion, the life of the white man has gotten immensely worse, and you know it. Okay, now, again, Rando on Twitter, I'm not saying he's speaking for anybody. He's not even, he self-identifies as a Christian fascist. He's not a Christian nationalist even. But here's the thing. After that tweet, I posted the tweet and was like, this is crazy stuff. The Twitter account of Gab CEO Andrew Torba responded to that vile tweet Go off, King. Now, Torba recently wrote a book entitled Christian Nationalism, a biblical guide for taking dominion and discipling nations. And he is notorious for posting anti-Semitic tweets. And that guy's book, Torba's book, he's the CEO of Gabby, has 300,000 followers. His book on Christian nationalism has three times the upvote to the, the, the reviews as Wolf's book on Amazon. Mm. So now, again, I'm not saying Wolf endorses any of that. Right. I, I'm not saying that. Absolutely not. In fact, I actually DM'd him. I asked him explicitly, uh, what did I say? I, I said something like, um, uh, are you opposed to interracial marriage? I think he said flatly no. I said, uh, are, if you, can people of different um, ancestries, like a Japanese person and a white person, can they be, they be the same ethnicity? He said yes, because the thing is basically about your people. So if a guy came from Japan and his family immigrated, you know, 60 years ago and he's come to America and he's now, you know, an American, he, he's an American, that's his ethnicity. So he's saying that, yeah, ethnicity in Wolf's mind is not race. It's not, he's, he is, ethnicity means basically, I mean, it's hard to say, but he's, he's definitely affirming that he's not saying inter ethnic marriage is wrong. He's not saying, when he talks about ethnicity, he's not saying Japanese Americans and, and white Americans are different ethnicities. He's saying you can both be the American ethnicity or something like that. Okay. I'm just saying this, there are plenty plenty of self-identified Christian nationalists who are straight up racist. Okay. I'm not accusing you just because you happen to identify as a Christian nationalist. I'm not saying you're a racist. I'm just saying it's a problem within this big tent movement that you need to be aware of. That's all I'm saying. Hmm. And that, that is very consistent with what I have seen as well. And um, I think that Wolf's answer I heard him give on one interview, I think was like, and to him, if the person, if, if you have two people that we would call different ethnicity, let's say mm -hmm. a European background and a Japanese person, if they're willing to fight and die to defend their land in mm -hmm. America, then they're the same. They're the ethnicity, same right. eth ethnicity, according mm -hmm. to his definition. Right. That it, it's about shared shared affiliation and shared beliefs that we will defend this ground. We will fight and die for our nation. And so it would be a straw man to call Wolf, I think, a white supremacist. Right. He, yeah. I, he I, says I, he's not interested at all in racial categories. It's not what he's thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. But it's confusing because he has yeah. a novel definition that seems to be excluded to one person in terms of how he's using it. But in the, the Christian nationalist movement more broadly, when you posted that tweet about, you know, well, you know, we don't want to make Hindu temples illegal. Mm -hmm. I, I knew you were in for trouble. Like right <laughs> well, when you, know, you posted I, it. Here's the thing. Uh, I almost posted, you don't want to make synagogues illegal. And I thought, you know what, just in case I won't post that because I don't want to see what crawls out of the woodwork mm. to, you know, to say, yes, we do want that. And some people actually, like I actually asked the Torba or his account, I don't know if it's his personal account or his CEO account, 
But I actually asked, well, what about synagogues? And he just kind of coyly posted a, a meme, like, well, wait and see. Like he didn't say yes or no, but he, he, he wouldn't say, well, no, not, th not those. Um, so anyway, the, the point is just that, and we'll get into this, I think, if you, you know, this is why I think Christian, Christians should, should not use the label Christian nationalism. They should not use it. Mm. There are many reasons why, but this is one, because um, you're going to be making, you're going to be sharing a tent with some really vile people. And there, so for many reasons, one of them is prudence. You don't want to do that. You know, wait, just wait until you get this great movement of yours. Then some CNN reporter sticks their mic in the front of some neo-Nazi who has a humongous following. And he says, yes, I'm a Christian nationalist. And we believe in, you know, kicking, deporting all the brown people. And you're like, uh oh, there goes your movement. And, and there are other reasons too. I mean, okay, I don't want to rant here. Guys, we're repeating, we're, what I'm seeing is a repeat of the woke movement in the church. Mm. You know, 10 years ago, five years ago, woke evangelicals were using these language of social justice and, and systemic oppression, all this stuff. And a few people like me and other people too, but we said, hey guys, you know, I don't think you want to use those terms because those terms are being used by some people that you don't actually, they don't, they're not Christians and they have some really, really bad ideas. But a lot of people within the woke movement didn't listen they circle the wagons they're like how dare you you're just racist you're just don't you don't like justice they wouldn't listen and say hey you know you're 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 circling your wagons around a few wolves not all but some and what five years later what happened well because they were they were committed to their tribe we're on the justice team justice what happened was their own theology started getting off because they were like well they're kind of they're kind of my people now so i want to defend the. i don't want to just protect the wolves or even ignore the wolves I'm kind of going to defend the wolves a little bit because they just care about justice so much. What I'm worried about is not only if you're going to build a, a big movement, a political movement and get consensus and build a coalition, you don't need people like this in your movement. It's going to kill your movement. But apart from that, I'm worried about your theology. Hmm. You start circling your wagons around these people that, that they're, they're sinning. You're going to start saying, well, they, they kind of have a point. Maybe, maybe I'm too harsh on them guys. This is what happened five years ago to the woke church. You don't don't go this route. You know, I'm saying I'm not I'm not trying to embarrass you or chide you. I'm just saying, hey, we have an example of this happening. It's only five years old. Please don't do it again. But I think that this is where theonomy comes in. Is that from their perspective, they don't believe that it's just commandments five through ten that yeah. should be part of the civil moral law. They think that we should also make commandments one to four part of the civil moral law. Mm. So we're going to have Sabbath laws. We're going to have anti-blasphemy laws. Mm -hmm. And they're, the way they're couching the conversation is if you don't get on board with us, if you don't get on board with our vision, you're compromising scripture. Mm -hmm. You There's only two options available. There's either you're on team God and God's law is eternal and that sort of a thing. And that includes, we're not going to have Hindu temples, you mm -hmm. know, or you're on, you know, kind of the classical liberal, which is really, you know, let's just be honest. It's one breath away from a being, being a progressive, you know, yeah. and this is how I'm seeing it in Christian circles, how the conversation is being painted is, right. well, it's not enough that you're just for, the general equity of the moral law. Mm -hmm. You have to be for the general equity of all 10 commandments. Yeah. This is where the connection of theonomy comes in. Right. And, and I, I will say too, I know the I know people who embrace theonomy who um it, like in my personal life when I shared some of this information with they they were like, "Oh my gosh, no, I'm not for this. I'm not for hmm, what that's really? talking about." So I don't want to paint everybody as the same. But this is really deeply disturbing. Um and it's disturbing because if we look at history, when culture gets chaotic, when things get chaotic as they've been and people start swinging to these real big extremes and like they react to one thing with the, you know, just the pendulum goes all the way to the other side. I mean, that's what can set things up for violence and, and just all manner of, of terrible things. <laughs> I don't have a better oh, word. Okay. Well, I will share one more quote to frighten you. Okay, good. I promise Scare to me. Stop. Um, <laughs> so one, one question, of course, that I would have for Christian national or self-identified Christian nationalists is, well, how do you, 
how do you plan on doing anything practical? Because you're still living in a democracy with laws and a constitution. And you know, certainly our constitution would not permit you, even on the most whatever interpretation, to just you know deport you know, all non-Christians. You just couldn't do that or to jail them. I think I don't think that's just, or even have a state church, which they kind of, some of them want a state church. So you'd have to, so how are you going to get there? Like, what is your practical action plan for getting enough voters to elect officials to get this Christian nation off the of ground or even a Christian city, wherever you want? Okay. Okay. So uh, here's how Wolf um, semi ends his book. He says, uh, open blasphemy in a chapter called The Right to Revolution. He writes this, open blasphemy in our public square is shrugged off as to be expected or part of the world's brokenness. We have settled into a posture of passive defense, bunkered down behind the artificial walls of churches and the porous borders separating the family and from society. A hostile and secularist ruling class roams free and few Christians are willing to take the struggle to a higher level. But we do not have to live like this. Here, I will justify violent revolution. Page 226. He then makes a standard just war argument for how, in principle, you could defend revolution. Like if, if you're if just war says, you know, if there are people, innocents being slaughtered and all these things, these conditions, and in principle, you could have a just war. And he says that applies to internal war as well, like civil war. If you're, if you're under a tyrant who's killing people, then you can rebel against him you know, under, under just war theory. Here's his conclusion. He includes, many want me to end with a word of caution perhaps to reassure everyone that these are academic conclusions, that they are not serious. Instead, I'll say this. It is to our shame that we sheepishly tolerate assaults on our Christian heritage, merely sighing or tweeting performative outrage of Republic blasphemy, impiety, irreverence, and perversity. We do not have to live like this, period. Hmm. Okay, so he's not saying to start a violent revolution. He's not saying that, but he is saying that's on the table. Okay. Wow. Now, uh, and I can, uh, no, he's saying in principle it is, and, he, and but he's not willing to say it's just in principle. He wants to make it clear he's not saying just in principle. He's saying, really, you ought to consider whether this is on the table. Um, okay. So, but my, my, so my point, besides frightening you, Elisa, I also <laughs> wanted to just point out that um, he, he, he is, uh, so, you know, he is, in some ways, not the kind of person that Whitehead and Perry were thinking about in their book. Right. He's denying things like flags in churches and and a political platform from the pulpit. He's not. He's saying we shouldn't do that. On the other hand, he's kind of the, exactly the people that Whitehead and Perry are targeting with their idea. And then actually, a later book called The Flag and the Cross, which I have read, have not reviewed yet uh, for various reasons. But they are claiming that yes, actually, radical Christian nationalists want violent revolution. And that's their thesis. Uh, and and it's white Christian nationalists who are racist who want to violently overthrow the government. Now, I'm just going to point out here that this is throwing fuel on the fire in the sense of you're giving, this is like their dream. They're like, please, someone write a book justifying violent revolution. Because <laughs> then, then we can get all of our donors to give us money and to launch a, you know, a war against Christian nationalism. And of course, they're going to broad brush everybody. And, and these are in the progressive end is going to say, you're all Christian nationalists. We got to keep ourselves safe and defend democracy. And so anyone who voices an opinion about abortion or same-sex marriage or any of these cultural issues, you're a Christian nationalist who wants to overthrow the government. You have to be crushed or silenced. Okay, mm -hmm. so my concern, I'm not a political theorist. I don't care about politics. I'll admit that. My big concern for the last five years has been wokeness, critical theory mm -hmm. in the tr culture in the church. Number one concern, my concerns are theological. People are abandoning Jesus. People are abandoning good theology and embracing these terrible woke ideas that are obviously in step with progressive politics. Okay, that's our number one threat. Now is the time to lock arms as believers and work against wokeness in laws, in culture, in the church, right? I'm not locking arms with racists. I'm sorry. I will draw some lines. You have to be a believer. I have to, you know, we, but we can, we should be able to lock arms with, you know, conservative. I mean, show me the conservative politician who would sign off on, on, on Wolf's book. They're not even the most conservative politician is going to mm -hmm. sign off on that. We're going to throw over to the constitution. They're not, they're not signing up for that. So this movement is not, I, I guess, to be practical here, 
you're not going to launch this awesome and glorious Christian revolution. What you what you are likely, I mean, with God, all things are possible. I don't know. But what's more likely to happen is you're going to alienate lots of Christian conservatives who will run into the arms of the woke mm. to escape this craziness. You will energize the woke and hand them the next eight elections because they can point to you and say, look at the insanity you have to deal with. Okay. So I'm just saying, as someone who cares not about politics, but about theology, now is the time for conservative evangelicals to lock arms theologically and start sitting up against wokeness, sure in mm. laws, sure in the government, sure in culture, sure in education, but primarily in the church, instead of bounding off into Christian monarchy land. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need to, we have a more pressing threat. And this is where I think, again, consensus building is really important, coalition building, finding people uh, who are conservative, but who are going to make incremental steps towards rooting out these ideas. So actually, uh, my friend Josh Dawes had a great thread where he contrasts uh, Christian nationalism, what he calls Project One, like Wolf's Project, with Christian federalism. And he would say Christian federalism is what you see in people like DeSantis, who are, they just want to reassert a traditional American approach toward governance, a federalist approach to state power, um, you know, getting activist teachers out of the schools, getting these activist curricula out of the schools. Now, th that's, again, that's a project people are getting behind. Mm -hmm. And that's, and it is making some progress. But you're going to alienate that n nascent coalition if you start saying, no, we need a Christian monarch right now. We need mm -hmm. to start getting guns. That's going to just tear this movement, this newly born movement to shreds. Again, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that because I care about politics. My main yeah. concern is you're going to have moderate pastors who are looking at, well, you know, this woke stuff sounds pretty bad. Oh, you want to burn down the country and install a monarchy. Okay, no. <laughs> I'm with the, the woke church. And I'm like, well, gosh, man, both choices yeah. are bad. Let's not do either. But there well, are I'm some in the Christian nationalist movement, though, Neil, that do want to do away with the Constitution. Yes. Oh, I and agree. Then, and then there are others who want a more gradualist approach. So I don't want to paint all Christian nationalists as having the same pathway to how we get there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I do think that there is a vulnerability of the, as a reaction to, well, I want to be a biblically faithful pastor. I want to be a biblically faithful Christian. Wokeness is bad, but I think it's sending some of those people who are wanting to preserve biblical fidelity. I'm seeing them run into the arms of Christian nationalists because it is posing as the biblical alternative. The, yeah, the only to alternative. Woke. You're either yeah. woke or you're a Christian nationalist. And it's yeah. funny because that's, it's like as of like what, three years ago, this thing wasn't even existing four years ago. It's suddenly yeah. it's like there are only two choices. So I've, what happened? Uh, but yeah, to your point, Krista, I totally agree. So I, I agree that you know, not all Christian nationalists, some of them would be horrified about some of the things that Wolf says. Others would love it. Um, again, Josh Dawes tries to tease out those two factions. And he's, his point is, if you want to have a, a successful political movement, you've got to start focusing on like incremental issues and not these overarching pie in the sky idealistic scenarios, because those are actually going to end up undermining the coalition you can build right now. Again, I'm, don't go, I'm not a, pol a pundit. I'm not here to give you political advice. Uh, my concern is I just think you're going to also, like you said, um, what's the other way is that you're going to, people that are just beginning to say, wait, maybe wokeness is a problem theologically. They're like, well, that's a way bigger problem. So I'm just go ahead and not care about wokeness. I'm like, mm, we're so close. Anyway. Mm. Okay. So this has been utterly fascinating and I want to direct everybody to further resources for sure. Go to shenbeapologetics.com to get Neil's very in-depth review of this book. And uh, if you're on Twitter, I got off Twitter because it's a mm -hmm. sewer. I'm, I admire you, Neil, that you're still duking it out on there. Um, but if you're on Twitter, follow Neil. Lots of great resources. He's always, you know, challenging the status quo and, and it's interesting mm -hmm. to see the reaction. Sometimes I'll, I'll just go peek and see what's going on on Twitter. And, um, and I want to, I want to end with this and I'm going to let each of you kind of have a last word here. So anything else that's just burning in your heart that you want to say, but I'd like to say this, I am very sympathetic with the 
instinct to be apolitical, to just Mm. duck out and be like, this is all crazy. I'm just going to live my life. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to worry about it. I, I am actually incredibly sympathetic to that instinct. And I think if I was just left to my nature, I would probably be that way. Um, but the Lord has actually convicted me just in this past year or so that, you know, if we're apolitical, then we're not actually contributing to being a solution to the problem. And our politics mm-hmm. should flow out of our theology. And we should be involved in such a way that we are protecting the most amount of people and and doing the best we can to help usher in good and moral laws. And I'm still just starting to think about this stuff more deeply. I do want to direct uh, our audience to a two-part series I did a few months ago on Christianity and politics. It was a two-part series about how to think theologically about politics with Dr. Jeff Myers from Summit Ministries. And then we did uh, an episode with Oz Guinness and uh, just kind of did a little two-part on that. If anybody wants more resources on how to think through these things as a Christian. And uh, with that said, uh, Krista, you know, take a minute or two. What what are you dying for our audience to know about this or what other resources would you direct them to? And then I'll, I'll let Neil have the last word. Yeah, I have a, several teaching series related to politics on my channel. So they can go to Theology Mom on YouTube and there's a playlist there on Christianity and politics. And I've done several teaching series along these lines with how my thoughts have developed so far and walking people through that. And I do want to encourage people to stay engaged in the political conversation. We live in a very unique moment in history. The, the most of human history has been one of tyrants and, mm. and difficulty and dictatorships. And we, we live in a very um, unique time of the great American experiment of a constitutional republic. I'm not ready to blow that up, Hmm. you know, and uh, I want to figure out a way forward. I'm sympathetic with my theonomist friends who want to preserve biblical fidelity. I'm very sympathetic with that. I don't in any way want to paint them as fringe or crazy. Because I really think in their heart, they want to um, be biblically faithful. I also think that political philosophy is something in in the, the amount of pluralistic society that we're currently living in is we're on a steep kind of learning curve and trying to figure this out in a very difficult time frame. And um, I just want to encourage people to uh, go a little slower and not be so quick to to pick sides. And mm. um, I'm mm. really trusting the Lord to bring some voices forward to um, innovate and provide clarity. I'm not ready to to fully um, put the the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments into civil law, but I'm sympathetic and I understand those people who want to be biblically faithful. And, you know, they do think that there should be laws against other religions. I don't think I agree with that, um, but I would be hard pressed right now to give a super detailed answer to that. And so that would be my other thing I want to tell people is it's okay to be thinking about it. It's okay to be learning. It's okay to not have it all ironed out because these are complicated issues. And um, I appreciate that Wolf has put forward his framework. I invite others to put forth their frameworks. I am all for a competition of ideas. Mm -hmm. Neil. Yeah, I I think I just have some questions. I think, you know, even the craziest ideas and frameworks, they they should make you re-examine why you believe what you believe, right? So like Krista said, when when a Christian nationalist says, for example, or like Wolf says, you know, we should be legislating the first table in the first four or five, you know, uh, commandments, not just the, le- the second table, not just the murder and adultery. Um, we should legislate all 10 commandments. And I say, no, you shouldn't. You say, well, why not? I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know. Well, good. See, that's a good thing. It's making me ask, well, why do I believe that? Am I even being consistent here? Uh, so I think those, I, I really, I truly believe that a lot of our uh, political evangelical political pundits 
have never really thought about the deep first mm -hmm. principles behind their uh, political stances. They kind of just go with the flow like I do, everyone does. So I, I think it's books like these force you to make a biblical case for what you believe and even to re-examine what you believe. So I'm, I'm, I'm for that. Um, uh, so I think it's, a, it's one good thing to think about. So I think in the, in the same way, I think that uh, when uh, Christian nationalists say we have to enforce all 10 commandments, well, they should make a case too. Um, and it, oftentimes their reasoning will reveal, you know, major principles like, well, is there discontinuity or continuity between the Old Testament and New Testament? The basic theological principles that are illuminated by uh, how they reason about government and law, for example. So I think these are all healthy things. Um, but I, I would say uh, one of the things that Wolf says repeatedly in his book that is not brought out more and especially is not evident in a lot of the reasoning of professing Christian nationalists on Twitter, which is a small population, I guess. But Wolf really emphasizes the need for prudence. What he keeps saying is that in this book, this is the ideal, the ideal situation. And I, I'm like, okay, so the ideal situation is a Christian prince who loves God, who's going to execute biblical justice, etc. But in one sense, though, a, a ideal case would also be a holy, regenerate Christian population. In other words, mm. thought experiment. Wolf's book actually makes a lot of sense if we're talking about a thousand Christians who go and colonize Mars. Mm-hmm. What are their laws going to be? They're all reformed evangelical Christians, Presbyterians. They land on Mars. I'd actually be like, well, this is not crazy for them. Mm. They all want it. They, they, I mean, when I, when I hate living under a, a government that said you can't blaspheme Jesus, I'm like, I wouldn't hate that. Actually, that'd be fine. I don't blaspheme Jesus, hopefully. So if it's, if it's the consent of the governed saying we actually want to obey God's law, then what's wrong with that? This is what the Puritans were doing. They like, came here because they wanted to escape and have their, this freedom to have their religious convictions lived out in law. So my point is the ideal that Wolf is envisioning is also, I think, implicitly uh, assumes a largely Christian believing populace. And he recognizes repeatedly in the reality of a largely pluralist, pluralistic non-Christian populace, you will have to make concessions. Ironically, the sort of popularizers of Christian nationalism don't seem to get that. They're the ones shouting, ban Hindu temples and deport all non-Christians. But he's not really saying that because it's always for him been about the ideal. And then he's, but he keeps saying prudentially in practice, this looks very different for every nation. We have to adjust. We have to, what will people tolerate? What can they support? We don't want to create a revolution. We don't want to create violence. We want to be gentle and, and push people gently, that, things like that. So and he's actually a lot more down to earth and realistic than some of these really extreme voices. So again, I, I, I'm not saying he doesn't say extreme things, but I'm saying, hey, we should at least embrace that thinking. There is, there's need to be compromise and prudence in how you govern. And actually that's, way built, built into the tradition that he's citing. The reformers did believe in that kind of you know, prudence, care, slowness, uh, hesitancy. They, they believed in that. So I think we should, at least, if we're not predict everything else he says, at least acknowledge that, that he's saying that and we should take it seriously too. Well, lots to think about. I'd like to thank my co-host, Krista Bontrager, and our guest, Neil Shenby. Again, go to shenbyapologetics.com for more on this topic and check out Krista's uh, Theology Mom podcast and YouTube channel, Facebook page. Uh, if you are looking for some deeper uh, education, some higher level education, I want to recommend Southern Evangelical Seminary. I am currently a student at SES. I'm loving my classes. I'm learning so much. I love that SES has a three-pronged approach to all of their classes. Every single class they teach is approached uh, from the disciplines of theology, philosophy, and apologetics. If you're interested in learning more, go to ses.edu slash alisa. You can download a free book. Check out the options there, ses.edu slash alisa. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, as always, it helps if you subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. If you're listening on audio platforms, if you'll go over to those platforms and rate us and give us a review. It's so helpful. Of course, posting on social media is always helpful as well. And let's remember that as we pursue Christ, let's keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time.